The Feudal Future Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And today we are delighted to have with us two experts both in the field and retired in the education area. Uh, Gloria Romero is former majority leader of the California State Senate and chair of the Senate Education Committee, and Mike Christensen is the retired superintendent of the Orange Unified School District, and today we're going to talk about the wonderful state of education in California. It's just, things couldn't be better. Joel, you want to start off with, uh, you want to start off with the first question? (laughs) Well, as you can tell, uh, Marshall has a good sense of humor, Um, but um, yeah, basically, Mike and Gloria, I just really... uh, um, I look at the the test numbers that come in for California, and it's they're constantly towards the bottom, even as we spend more money. So, uh, Mike, you used to be a, a superintendent. Uh, what gives here? Well, Joel, um, I wish I could answer that in just a couple of seconds, but I, I don't think that's possible. There's a there's a whole culture shift that's gone on um, over the last few decades of taking responsibility, in my opinion, this is all just my opinion, but taking responsibility away from um, students and families and putting it on teachers and educators and saying it's the teacher's fault, teachers need to do more, teachers have, it's it's their fault if things don't progress with education, as opposed to, you know, they have an obligation and a responsibility to present material in an understandable way to help guide students and guide families, but students need to learn. It, it's They have to be engaged. It's it's like physical fitness. You can sit somewhere and watch somebody running a track meet or working out, but you're not gonna gather that through osmosis. You actually have to use your brain and engage and learn. And that I think there's been this push of the teachers are at fault, the teachers are at fault, as opposed to it's a partnership. And um, our students have to engage and they have to do work in order to be able to learn and be successful. So I think it's, it's just been a transition that's happening uh, in California, created back in 2001, the high school exit exam. Um, you know, Joel, Marshall and I, we've talked about that some and included that in some write-ups, but we've gone away from that, right? That, that accountability model. Um, and I understand the reasons why, but there needs to be some level, in my opinion, some level of accountability. So there's a measurement um, going forward. If we can't create that sense of accomplishment for students and encourage them to learn, not just for the sake of learning, but to be able to to demonstrate that they are learning and they're being successful. And as opposed to being concerned about who we're alienating or who's not being successful and trying to deal with that and address that um, has created this need for competition within education. And that competition comes from various political places, um, solutions to some of those, such as the, we have now the charter school movement, which is, is, is pretty strong. We've got conversion charters. I had two middle schools that were converted from just your regular public schools to a charter public school. So they were basically self-managed and continue to be self-managed. And that was in the late nineties and early two thousands. Um, and that was kind of an answer to the voucher political drive that was, it was coming up. So we're giving families, teachers, education groups an alternative. And I think uh, my my colleague, if I can be so bold as to call her that, um, and Gloria Romero um, will, will address some of that in her work with charter schools as an alternative. But again, still a public school answer to a problem. And um, but I, I just think we've we've moved away from that really engaging families and students and, and making it their responsibility also to partner and learn. Well, and, and Gloria, you, you've seen this so from so many different perspectives, from a political perspective, from a statewide perspective, and now from you're heavily involved in the charter school movement. Uh, do you see things the same way Mike does, or is it have a, a different big picture to you? Um, with all due respect to our colleague, I actually see it quite differently. Um, I, I, let me start with saying that, you know, education is to me the most important aspect of what we call the American dream. Uh, Without a good solid education, 
We're not going to find uh, basically home ownership. We're not going to find the, the investment in communities. We'll find increased crime rates. At the same time that I oversaw the education committee, I also oversaw the prison committee. And I tell people I've been virtually every prison in California for nothing that I've done, of course. But it was not lost on me that that 70 percent of inmates did not have a high school diploma. Now, I believe in personal responsibility, and I do concur with Mike that, yes, family student uh, responsibility is of utmost important. But let's take a look at what happened. I mean, we talk about the public education system, but what, what I've seen is more it's more geared and structured and politicized to be a public works system and the education of children be damned the participation of parents be ridiculed and, and mocked. My mother had a sixth grade level of education. I have a PhD. My mother was involved. And I've seen in my work with parents and the writing of the Parent Empowerment Act of 2010, which by the way, California school boards, California districts, of course, the teachers unions, all the alphabet soup of special interests in California, lined up to vehemently oppose this piece of legislation, which basically gives parents choice. So I'll start from there, basically. Amanda, the I'm doing a podcast. Yes, we are. Hi, Mandy. We'll edit, we'll edit that piece out. Or maybe uh, keep it in for color. Who knows? You know. <laughs> but um, Yeah, I but, think it's also good to things that happen during a podcast. <laughs> but... You know, it's interesting your your perspective on this, Gloria and Mike. At the center of the controversy is what the role of teachers is and the role of the teachers' unions. You know, Mike, your argument is that there's been a culture shift that's put up, put this burden on the shoulders of the teachers to have to, um, you know, keep the kids engaged and, and kind of put on a show every day. And your argument, Gloria, is that the teachers' unions have been kind of resistant in uh, adapting to the needs of what the community is. Uh, what is the what what is happening with the teachers? What kind of a force are they for change or not change? Well, I mean, if I can, I think you have to separate teachers from teachers unions. Mm. I think it's very easy to put people all in a bucket and say, because I don't agree with or somebody doesn't agree with uh, the CTA at Sacramento or, you know, federal teachers, that all teachers are bad. You know, in Orange, one of the things that makes that district or has made that district successful in the past was the teachers who taught there lived there. Their, their kids went to school there. It was very neighbor oriented, family oriented. And they tried the majority of them, certainly not all, but the majority of them worked very hard to help educate our students. But it has been politicized, which I do agree with Lori. I think she phrases it differently than I do, but um, that this political involvement, this on high demand that's coming from Sacramento to create a high school exit exam, stop a high school exit exam, trying to do all these, these political maneuverings instead of focusing on what the basics and what kids need to know. You know, when, when somebody gets a high school diploma, it should mean something. A college diploma should mean something. It shouldn't just be, you know, you're being paroled now. You've been in high school this many years and now you're on your way out. So we're going to have a big ceremony, but kids can't read or write effectively. Uh, don't know mathematics. I, I, I think that's the, so So my sense is we need to separate, just like some charter schools are excellent. Some charter schools are probably not so much so. Um, it, it's, yeah, I think to put all into a basket is, misleading. And I think that is part of our problem with this, the left and the right not being able to come together in the middle. And we, we need to acknowledge what works um, everywhere and then also acknowledge what doesn't work. And that's my I, that's my take on the whole, you know, all teachers are bad. I, I just don't, I don't think Lori is saying that because she's going to hire teachers, right? To teach oh, those well, kids. Let's hear what Lori actually does. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in, in, in politics, it's always follow the money. And it's especially true in the world of education in California. Uh, in California, almost half of every state budget goes to education. 
Uh, it's it's incredible. It's like a runaway escalator that doesn't pause. It doesn't stop. And the question that people ask is, where what is the bang for our buck? We know that in looking at who controls the budget in Sacramento, very powerful special forces. The number one political power in California, it's not pharmaceutical companies. It's not, you know, oil, big oil, big tobacco. It really is teachers unions, bottom line. And you can go through and look at the Secretary of State for all the contributions, et cetera. So this is the most powerful political force in California. And their number one job and affiliated with, you know, Randy Weingarten at the national level is basically to do what is best for their members. End of story. That's really what they do. And what that means then is basically to basically deny that the most important variable in the classroom is really teachers. And we've seen that in study after study. But what happens, though, in California is this crazy system whereby if a teacher shows up and just breathes for 15 months, you have tenure for life. Now, for purpose of full disclosure, I have tenure. I was a professor at Cal State LA. I've got, you know, I earned tenure. But even if you think about it, at the, in higher education, tenure is typically achieved after seven years. And it's rigorous. I mean, all kinds of issues, teaching, community service, research, grants, but a strong emphasis on teaching. In the in the Cal in the uh, K through 12. Basically, you breathe for 15 months and you've got a job for life. What I tried to do and what a number of people did was actually to say, OK, let's reward good teaching. You shouldn't have a job for life. In fact, you shouldn't even have a job just for showing up and breathing. Let's look at accountability. If we want accountability, let's start with the most important variable. It is the teacher. It is the workforce. And I believe when you look at the rank and file, because I do agree with Mike, the rank and file is different from the leadership. But until you throw out that leadership, you're going to keep getting the same old, same old. So I do support the move towards, I do believe in testing. I do believe in standardized testing. It's not teaching to the test. It's a barometer of how we're doing. And because California has so failed, there have been efforts to try to get rid of the test. It's like walking into Weight Watchers, which I have done, and to say, I'm not going to step on the scale because I don't want to know the outcome. We can't do that. We have to have the courage to look at the dashboard and make it clear and concise. And the best way to do that is to really take a look and link accountability, to provide for some type of merit pay, to provide for some type of outcome associated with the quality of teaching and the outcome of students. There's a way to do that. There's percentages in contracts. We do that in the private arena. You don't just get a job for life because you show up, but we do that in public education, especially in California, because we don't have school choice, we don't have a portfolio, and our leaders in Sacramento, and I have witnessed it personally, just kowtow and bow down and hide in fear to the power of the teachers union, which has the ability to snuff out political lies. That's what it's about. Well, I, you know, in, as a free market economist myself, uh, the solution to this, from a knee-jerk perspective, from an economics perspective, you know, professor, is competition. And the idea that there needs to be an alternative to the public school system. And I would think that the charter school system would be the potential competitor that could kind of right the ship. What is happening with that? Is that getting killed by the teachers unions? Is that progressing? Where, where are we in creating a viable alternative system to the current one. I'll jump in on, on this one at this point. Uh, absolutely. But it's not only charter schools. It's also homeschooling. And we've seen that since the, uh, you know, Randy Weingarten and the teachers unions went along and said, shut down the schools, parents really got a, a first glimpse by sitting on Zoom uh, to basically see what was happening or not happening in their kids' classrooms. So there's a whole portfolio of choices. And I agree with Mike, there are some really good charter schools and there's some pretty pathetic ones. And they should be held accountable and they should be shut down when they are not performing. 
because outcomes matter and outcomes are the kids. But overall, in terms of the structure in California and across the country, charter schools are outperforming because you can have greater creativity over curriculum. And guess what? You can fire a teacher if they are not performing. Golly gee, what a concept. Yeah. Uh, but I also think too, you know, I do believe that charter schools are not the only answer. I am, and I happen to be a Democrat, but I am one of those Democrats that believes in uh, opportunity scholarships. You can call them vouchers, whatever you want to call them. I believe in the right of parents to do what is best for their child, not the government, not the union, not the politicians, it's the parents' right. And if the Catholic school down the street is the best choice, then go there. Interestingly, and then I'll stop, if you think about it, the only area in education where we prevent, and we make a big thing about, oh, it's privatizing education, is K through 12, where the teachers' unions are. We don't cry about, about grants and, and, and private scholarships going in preschool, or higher education. Take a look at Chapman. What is your federal funding? And nobody's saying, oh my God, it's privatization of education. We only fight about this because the teachers unions try to prevent it. If there's more money for them, there's more members, they grow. They're the only ones who benefit from prohibiting opportunity scholarships, vouchers, whatever you want to call it. I want the whole gamut. I believe in competition. And when you fight for the rights of kids and parents see it, you'll thrive. Mike, what do you think? Um, I, I think what Gloria says is compelling. I've heard her say it before and I, I didn't disagree before. I don't disagree now. Um, but I think that what has to happen is we, we get back to this testing, right? Standardized testing is a way to equalize across the board. Um, you'll hear my peers, and, and it, again, they're not wrong, but there's if you're running a public school or public school district, traditional public school district, because charter schools are public schools, but you know, a traditional public school district, you know, we have kids that are in the hospital. We have to educate them. We have kids with disabilities. We have to educate them. We we are required by law to provide services for them. And while charter schools in general don't have the ability to provide that education. We do a better job of it. Okay, that's fine. Um, but so when you're comparing apples and oranges and testing, it just needs to come up with a way, we need to come up with a way where testing is is fair and equitable across different groups. So instead of just having a you know, an exit exam, you know, there need to be different levels of testing because I do agree accountability is super important and we have to have uh, parents, the, you have to give parents the ability to choose. We have that in Orange Unified within the district. They could go to any school they want in the district. And we have many parents who choose to take their kids to a different school than where they live. Um, but, you know, that's that's halfway there. There are now more charter schools um, in California than there have been in the past. They're growing, still growing more in Orange Unified. Um, and I think the only way they grow is because there's demand. So for people to say that, this is being made out of whole cloth by by people like Gloria who are out praising this. No, parents are buying into it and they're supporting it. And that's part of parent engagement that I was referring to earlier. We don't engage our parents. We don't make it their responsibility with their kids to learn. And I think that's a big problem with this. And it's, it's a, a CTA, it's a teacher's union thing about it's all us, it's all us, it's all the teacher it's 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 that combination and that's what we need and i think that's what gloria is you know espousing but, you know, in her let, position let me stop you there for a second because sure. you said something that i i kind of had a visceral reaction to which is <clears throat> the goal of being able to provide services to everybody so that everybody gets a base level which by the way is is fine right we should we need to have some standard level of you know that says Below this, you're not, it's not acceptable. Above this, it's acceptable. But what I find as a as a teacher myself, as a professor, is that the people coming in, the, the they don't have the the excellence is missing. The yep. base level stuff is there sometimes, and it's <laughs> ebbing, frankly. You know, we the number of people that that can't count is just is insane to me, but I'm being a little bit over dramatic. But um, isn't it the responsibility of 
K through 12 to be able to accommodate or encourage people to excel, not just hit a minimum? Yeah, so I, it's, I, I just, sorry, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, just because I've, I've been wanting to ask about this as well. You know, we're, we're teaching at college. We're at the receiving end of what comes out of K-12. And what almost all the people I talk to at Chapman talk about is that the kids, and look, you got to say the Chapman student's going to be above average, uh, you know, uh, so they're, they should be doing better. A lot of them come from, from, you know, what are seen as very good suburban uh, school districts. And yet their knowledge level is unbelievably low, particularly history. I mean, I find myself in a bizarre situation. My kids know so little history, even though, let's say, Christianity, that I have to explain who St. Paul was. Now, I'm the I'm the, the great-grandson of a Latvian rabbi, and I'm explaining why, Saint, who St. Paul is to Gentile kids. You, I put up a picture of Lenin in the classroom. 32 kids, two of them recognize who Lenin was. One of the most famous visages. Try to the, ask them about the the um, the Soviet Union. They never taught about taught about it at all, and and so I think the, one of the biggest issues I see is that kids are going through school, even relatively bright, well-adjusted kids with no knowledge, and so they come to college. Then they get the activist scholars on top of them. They 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 have no knowledge. I mean, we've seen this, for instance, in the current situation with Israel. Um, you know, not that there isn't room for debate, but, you know, people, people think that uh, things that are just ab absurd. And then I've had other students, and I'll, I'll stop with this, who said that they went to high school there, that they were being told that their kids, that the kids were told that all white people were racist. This was, and of course, the two kids who most objected to it were kids of mixed parents. Who said, "Well, my dad's not a racist," you know, but I mean, what's going on in the schools where not only do they know nothing, but they're but now they're also being indoctrinated with no ability to respond. Has that become more of a concern? And and is there anything we can do about it? It you know, when I was chair of the education committee, what I saw throughout the year. And I was in Sacramento for 12 years, not always chair of education, but on the education, I think for the entire 12 years. At that time, and I started in 1998, left 2010. So I'm speaking about that time frame, but it hasn't changed much. Every year I would see the interplay between the federal government, state, local, et cetera. And uh, especially during the time that I was there, there were strong federal laws on the books, whatever one can say about No Child Left Behind. Remember, that was bipartisan. That was George W. Bush and the lion of the Senate, Ted Kennedy. So no liberal or progressive can start complaining about No Child Left Behind. But to me, the, the power of that, and there were flaws, absolutely, but the power of that was demanding accountability and to say, if the school district itself, which receives millions of dollars from federal and state entities, is not performing, then there were a myriad of options from replacing the superintendent or, or restructuring or shutting it down. But you know what would happen? Nothing. Nothing ever happened in all during that time. And we would see numbers. And even though, yeah, it was one number, it's imperfect, but still, it's a signpost that says, you know what, Houston, we have a problem. And up and down the state of California, we had problems because kids were not reading, even at grade level, forget even achieving excellence. So that's why when when I wrote the Parent Empowerment Act and we did the race to the top, a lot of flaws with that. But remember, that was Obama sponsored. Governor Schwarzenegger participated in that. We had a package that we put forward to try to get some. So basically, to go back to your question, Joel, there's so much that we can do. It's not like it's a lost cause, but what is difficult to overcome is basically the political blocks that are there. And you find the unwillingness of California School Boards Association, the districts, you find you know, the, all the Democratic politicians in Sacramento who will not get their pay, 
you know, their campaign contribution to run for the next office or run for re-election because they don't like this. Literally, when I was running the Parent Empowerment Act uh, of 2010, I would go knock on doors of Democrats, fellow Democrats. First question they'd ask was, where's CTA on this? That would be the first question that they would ask. And largely, it was a matter of fear. So I think that you know this challenge has to come from the outside. Uh, it has to really be, and I think what's powerful is the parent rights movement that is pushing this to new heights. And I think with uh, with looking at at teachers overall, I think the most important thing it's not it you know it's not it, it, you know it's not like rocket science, but we know that if kids are not reading, and typically by age nine then it, each year that goes by, it becomes more lost. And that is something we can achieve, we, we need to achieve. And Mike is absolutely right. We have challenges in the system. We've got homeless youth, foster youth, English language learners, poverty kids, et cetera. But nowhere in our constitution and in public education does it say, send us only the brightest kids. If we're public education, then we take who we get and there are ways to treat and educate child. I was a poor kid. I would have been defined as English language learner had there been that in my day. You know, my mother had a sixth grade level of education. I would have been written off. And if you take a look at what I got in high school, for the most part, I did get written off. But it's no excuse to not have high expectations and to teach children to read. And when we do that in like first, second, third grade, we're on the path to moving forward. That's really where it begins. And the rest is cleanup in aisle nine that we've been doing year after year. What, you know, what about the role of online education? You know, we're in a, a different era today where students are able to engage with uh, with computers in ways that we would have thought inconceivable, right? We would have thought, no, education's got to be a, a teacher-driven thing. But what about that? Are we looking at the potential of a, of accreditation for online courses for K through 12? Well, I, I'm not aware that there is an accreditation for online courses, because as Gloria said, there's a certain political component that you'd have to get past in order to be able to implement something like that. And while everybody ran to online education during COVID, um, it's backed away and want to get control and want to... Um, uh, keep kids in classrooms and be able to keep, you know, you, you lose the money follows the child, right? You get, you get paid based on the student that shows up at school. So when students go leave a district because they're going to homeschool or because they're going to a charter school or they're going to a parochial school, then district is not receiving that funding. So that's going to be, you know, every 30 kids equates a teacher roughly. So there, there is a whole political component to that, to getting beyond that. And this getting to the charter school point back and, you know, back when Gloria was there, it was a struggle. It was a, a, a long slog in order to get to this kind of solution, this compromise. Uh, if, if I can go back to just one thing about in terms of teaching um, and excellence, there has been a, a mandate, if you will, and I'm not, I don't know if that's fair to say, but I, that's my perception, that it's there's, there's this mandate to kind of teach to the bottom. In other words, we do differential teaching, it should be throughout, right? If a student's a gate student, that person should be able to get challenged and engaged and as far as they can possibly go. And if somebody needs special um, assistance, they're dyslexic, whatever it is, that we provide them that assistance. But there's been this, this, this lowering of the bar to where it includes everybody. So it's it's like my a little kid's soccer team. Everybody gets a trophy right at the end of the year. Everybody's successful. Everybody wins. And that is not reality. And I think we're doing a disservice to everybody. So to Gloria's point, absolutely. You know, the first three years, you're learning to read. After that, you're reading to learn. If, if we don't have some kind of basic assessments at that level so that we are acknowledging what teachers are doing, what need to be done, what works. Because the other thing we see in California is curriculum changes, strategies change. Oh, we're going to have new math. And then they talk about that and they implement it for 6 million kids all overnight, as opposed to, well, try it here or try it there. It's, it, it is a little bit crazy in the way that we um, change curriculum. But yeah, I, I, accountability at that level, especially for reading basic mathematics at, at very low levels, 
um, where you can do something about it and provide those supports to, to help those kids come along is so important and it doesn't exist. So um, I guess what maybe what we should probably leave the listeners with is how the hell do we fix this mess? We're spending more and more money. The kids are getting less and less well-educated. Um, you know, I certainly notice it, for instance, in civics that they just, they have no idea how the country r- runs and obviously things like history. So, you know, but, and obviously if they don't read, it doesn't help. So can we turn this around? I mean, we California is a rich state. We spend a lot of money per student. What what do you each think would be the right steps to sort of turn this around? I think there's different levels of where we turn it around. Uh, some of them are on a wish list because I just don't think politically we're going to be there in terms of the money, like at the state level. I mean, who is governor? Who's in the, uh, we have a one party state. It happens to be my party and I don't recognize my party anymore, but it's still beholden to the special interests that make it a public works program rather than a public education program. So where I would begin is really to flip it. Uh, And you can call it a walkaway movement. You can call it school choice, whatever. But I do believe in amplifying opportunities for school choice, charter schools, homeschooling, the micro schools, whatever. Online can be successful as well. I prefer in class, but looking at a portfolio because kids learn differently. So I support that. I think truly parent rights uh, as well for the parents to be involved. Uh, I, uh, along with uh, former ambassador Rick Grinnell, we supported uh, looking at opportunity scholarships for California. That didn't make the ballot, you know, again, to decided when COVID hit, pulled it, let's wait on that. But similar to what other states are doing, I do believe that we need something like a an opportunity scholarship that would enable truly school choice uh, uh, for children to go forward. But at the local level, I do think, and I oftentimes suggest to people, don't even bother anymore giving your money, your campaign contributions to statewide officials. You're going to get the same thing. You know, again, too, it's like insanity. Keep doing the same thing, expecting something different. And we're still getting quite frankly, crappy scores on education. So I've suggested really focus at the local level. Uh, look at your local school boards. Right now in the city of Orange, there in the Orange Unified School District, there is an attempt to recall two members of a reform coalition that came about, status quo, the empire striking back, trying to take them out, but we've seen the effort and the choice of parents. And so I believe, you know, to to vote, and I don't believe in trying to recall them at this time for reasons that I believe the voters spoke to say, we want to turn these around. Orange overall has a great reputation, but what I've seen throughout uh, California is you have the gaps and those gaps are really race-based. You have strong achievement gaps when it comes to especially poverty, English learners, African-American, Latino children. And those gaps have got to be closed. Otherwise, you know, we're just not going to advance as a state. So I would say focus in terms of what we see. And if we can start turning around at the local level with local boards, I think eventually we get other changes. But the more and more that parents leave, the message is being sent to school districts and to Sacramento. This is a product that needs to be changed. It's just not working. And it's it's not meant with disrespect. It's meant with it's real. And we can't afford to wait years and years and years to transform kids' lives. We've got 12 years in an education system. And how much of it is wasted already? And Mike, right. as, as a, a person who's built his entire career on the ground in a school district, what's your recommendation on how we fix this? Well, uh, ideally, I would like to see someone like a John F. Kennedy stand up and say, you know, just like we had the physical fitness challenge back in the early 60s, we need a, you know, a Gavin Newsom type position to say, where well, I'm about education. I'm about holding you know, teachers, school districts, everybody accountable, but then you need to push that authority down to the locals, right? Let them educate. You know, an example is um, Newsom just signed, Gavin Newsom just signed a bill about bringing cursive writing back in California. And it's going to be mandated that everybody teach all, all elementary schools teach cursive writing. 
Well, they've already been doing it. They never stopped doing it in Oceanside. So if that's important to local districts and to parents, it'll be done. But there's this perception that we just have to do whatever the state tells us at the local level to do, as opposed to letting the locals run their own school district. Then you get into, I think, a school choice thing where you're you're moving from one to another, as opposed to, you know, you go from Orange to Tustin or Orange to Placentia or, you know, wherever it is. And it's kind of the same thing, just a different, you know, a different day, a different face. So I, I think that getting more local control, while it's talked about, it has been talked about in Sacramento, it's not very real. And, and giving that local control is, is huge in order to getting parents to have control. People just leaving the school system, while it will have an impact, you can see what people leaving California has done to taxes in California, right? Nothing's changed. It just, they tax the other people that are here more. So I, 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 while I don't disagree that people should do that, if that's what they think is important, I don't think that's going to affect change short of somebody, some political leader standing up at a high level and saying, we're going to focus on this and everybody else be damned. We have to do it for the future of our students and appreciate what the great equalizer is in our country. And that's public education. Well, that's very interesting. You know, you, you, you kind of you've laid out a world where you have two choices, engagement on the part of parents and rejection on the part of parents as the two ends of the spectrum, right? Either just jump in as a parent and make sure that you're really involved in the what it is that's being taught and how it is that it's being taught in the existing system, or basically step away from it and say, no, we're going to, we're going to go create an alternative system, a charter school, an online school, a home school. Um, it seems to me that um, those are relatively stark choices. But I, but I think they're really the same. It's parent engagement, right? It's, it's parents being involved in the education of their, their children, of the family, the community being involved, you know, our libraries being involved. I mean, there's a whole um, set of, of community engagement places and some are better than others for sure. Certainly you get in the, in the central Valley, um, you go up, you know, along Highway 101 and some of those super small farming communities and the challenges that they have, but it's still important. And if if we don't get every student, you know, to come to school in kindergarten, which is also not mandatory, it's only first grade is mandatory, but, you know, we, some kids don't even come to this country till fourth grade, to a fourth grade age. And so we need to acknowledge that as well and, and try to deal with that. But by having community engagement, communities can respond to the needs of their families better than Sacramento can. Gloria, and, final word to you. Well, again, it's not just engagement. I really think too, it's empowerment. Uh, the the Parent Teachers Association, with all due respect, I saw it more the T rather than the P. Uh, so I don't want to just show up for a bake sale. I don't even know those are allowed anymore <laughs> in local schools, districts. But it really is, I think, to school choice because parents our partner, parents, I say to are the first teacher at home, but parents are not the teacher. If, if they are, then, then, you know, redirect all the state funds to the parent. So I think to the engagement, the change is needed from the system itself. This is about a systems analysis and a systems change. Parents as consumers, I can go to McDonald's or I can go to, you know, to Carl's Jr. or some a sushi bar. I don't have to take my money to this one place. So there's choice. And I do believe that with education, education should be a portfolio of choices that works for that parent the money, it's not extra money. It's the same tax dollar, but parents, not just with engagement, but with empowerment can take the dollar that would be allocated for that one district to say, this dollar is going to work differently for me. And that's the power of school choice when we offer that. And I believe that California needs to. We've made progress, but we're still far behind where we need to be. Well, Gloria, thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. This has been um, uh, quite uplifting, actually. The, the notion that we have alternatives that we can fall back on and look at and experiment with uh, gives us hope that there is uh, the potential of improving the K-12 through uh, education system. Thank you for being a guest on the Feudal Future podcast, and we look forward to having you back to discuss this in, in further depth uh, soon. The Feudal Future